Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. I'm here today with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. Uh, Venkat, what's our letter today? Today we are doing U, U for universal. U for universal. Um, so what are some, so are we just gonna, we're going to go through and list off some universal things, right? Um, yeah, so that's going to be our game, which we've played a few times before. Yeah. So uh, we'll take turns naming things that are universal. Okay, right? well- do you want to start? Um, or should I start? Uh, all right. Why don't you go first? Yeah. Okay. So my universal thing is language. So universal language, as in Esperanto or something? No, language. Language. The concept of language. Oh. Okay. Okay. Universal, I guess, across humans. Huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. So universal across humans. All right. My first U is uh, a USB universal serial bus. Mm, that was universal in the name. Isn't that cheating? Uh, that was my intent with the game. It, uh, I think it should have universal in the game. Um, right. And otherwise, it, it can just have universal as a property or attribute. All right, what's your I second see. universal thing? I was going to say, well, it has to have the word universal in it. Uh, universal Studios. Universal Studios. Okay. <laughs> uh, they have a, a theme park here in LA. We went before the pandemic. Oh. All right, what's my number two universal? I will also go with universal language, but specifically Esperanto, not the concept of language as universal, but Esperanto. All um, right. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna say universal friend is the, the dog. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a bit of a stretch. Universal friend is a dog. I don't know that I like dogs that much. I like cats. Okay, universal mm-hmm. friend of the dog. All right, so you're a tree. Let me. But would you call a cat friendly? I mean, there are mean cats, just as there are mean dogs. I mean, there's the idea of a dog or cat, uh, like in popular culture, but then there's real cats and dogs which tend to have their own personality, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, I've seen friendly cats and standoffish cats. I've seen friendly dogs and standoffish dogs. So I think dogs in general are slightly more friendly anyway okay so my third universal sticking with the language team would be a universal translator as on star trek or as as in the uh, babel fish that you put in your ear in hitchhiker's guide it can translate between any two languages all right universal translator Mm, i don't i think i'm gonna i've only hit three (laughs) i'm not thinking of several more oh no um, I was going to say, isn't there like a universal tool set, but I'm making that up. That's not universal hex wrench, universal, uh, mm. I, I don't think so. Those come in different sizes and shapes. It's like the one size fits all for clothing. That's kind of a universal, um, all right, I'll give you that one universal sizing. I'll give you half a point for that one. So okay, you're at three okay. and a half. Uh, uh, I'm going to steal one which you should have thought of was universal Turing machine. You're the computer person here. Am I the computer person, Venkat? I hear you're coding these days. I'm starting, but you're the professional developer. So it's true. Uh, yeah, I'm taking universal Turing machine. Is that really, it's not universal, is it? Is it universal? I mean, the subset of Turing machines that can uh, compute anything are called universal Turing machines. Okay. I want to say like the the Conway's Game of Life. I don't know why that's universal. That's not universal, Lisa. Uh, Yeah, it is. It's equivalent to a universal Turing machine, I think. It's, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's what, when they say Turing complete, they mean it's equivalent to a Turing, universal Turing machine. All right, uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about that because it sounds like another of those topics where even though you do a lot more computer stuff, I've kind of read more of the textbook theory. Um, uh, it's perhaps, yeah. Yeah, uh, all right. So, uh, okay, I did universal Turing machines. What's your um, four and a half one? Mm. Oh. Well, I guess this is more on the universal language thing. Isn't love the universal language? All right. Love is the universal language. That's, again, sort of a poetic sentiment. All right. But sticking with the theme, 
I guess I'll go with my last one being uh, uh, universal values or, you know, what religions and ideologies claim to be universalist, right? So universalism in the sense of ideology, which I think is uh, a superset of uh, love as a universal value. So like, you know, other sets of values that ideologies claim to have. Universal yeah. brotherhood, right? Like, uh, I don't know about, I think universal brotherhood is uh, one specifically claimed by Islam. So one of the sort of core tenets of Islam is uh, universal brotherhood, which leaves out all women. So it's not exactly universal in that sense. But it's uh, universal in terms of the set of all brothers, right? Yeah. And, and I think it's meant to stand in for all humans, like in that old uh, gendered way of talking. All right, well, so that's I think they would have said all humans if they meant it. I refuse to believe people don't say what they mean. I tend to generally agree with you, but I tend to also think there are idiomatic ways of speaking from like the past that like, like even if you look at like um, women philosophers writing about humanity at large, like uh, Hannah Arendt, who we both like, she mm. uses the word mankind, right? But she clearly okay. means um, homo sapiens, the entire species. So mankind is just sort of an I don't know, idiomatic gendered way of speaking about it in her time. Yeah, I think in that way. I think I understand. Yeah, okay. There are exceptions. All right. So we've got a bunch of universal things. So let's talk about, uh, yeah. What? Uh, it's kind of interesting. When I've thought of uh, suggesting the theme of universal for uh, today's episode, my first thought went to like the sort of more lofty end of stuff, like, you know, universal values or universal brotherhood or universal love kind of stuff. But then my very next thought was USB, universal serial bus. And then it struck me that even though the lofty stuff promises a lot more, it fails a lot more in practice. Whereas the sort of mundane stuff promises much less, like a USB cable only promises to connect a bunch of computer peripherals, but it kind of gets farther towards actually delivering. Like, I mean, USB cables are frustrating and sometimes don't work, but it's like, closer to actually universal than the lofty philosophical things. Well, I think this is kind of an interesting, okay, this is an interesting kind of thing to like do a compare and contrast to like USB versus universal values, right? Um, and that like, where does like, I guess I'm thinking of it from like a protocol, like what is the USB? Well, USB is a protocol, right? And people like build to the protocol. So it's really like the mapping of like seeing USB's actual adoption to becoming universal is actually a, you can map that back to the spread and proliferation of a single standard like a it's almost like there being one core truth that everyone has like agreed is the core truth and so the fact that usb is universal is because everyone as a society has decided that the protocol that is usb is the one core truth that we're going to use for like communicating data um so there's like there's a certain amount of like agreement and adoption that has to happen in order for it to actually become the universal standard. Okay, so let's talk about that since you work on stuff like Bitcoin wallets and you have to like work to like specifications that are standards and some claim universal versus not. Is there, what's the difference if in fact there is one between just a standard and a universal standard? Like, you know, container shipping has standard size boxes um, lots yeah. of things say they're standards, they're standard size nuts and bolts. So what's, what makes a standard a universal standard? Adoption. Adoption is the only difference between a standard and a universal standard. And a universal standard is one that has been adopted widely. Widely enough to be a monopoly in its uh, domain of sorts, right? Network effects, right? Widely enough such that not being on the platform has outsized costs. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's a good way of putting it. Not being on the platform has outside costs. Um, uh, outsized, yeah. Uh, outsized costs, yeah. Uh, I actually had an interesting thought about this in a thread I was tweeting last week about the idea of a caste system. So a caste system gives everybody a role in society with like superior, inferior kind of relationships. Mm -hmm. And like people are not experienced with an actual caste system like in India where it's explicitly codified. Mm -hmm. They don't realize something very interesting, which is being an outcast, which means like, you know, not being included in the scheme at all, 
is actually much costlier than having like an inferior position in the cast. Because if you have an inferior position, at least you have a recognized role and it might be a sucky one, but you have a job, you have opportunities, you have like standard expectations of others and rights and responsibilities, even if they're very like unequal and oppressive. Whereas being an outcast means you're left out of the scheme altogether. But here's the funny thing, being an outcast is only like oppressively bad with outsized costs uh, or costs if the caste system is like a monopoly. Like if it uh, uses up and organizes so many of the resources, like say a country has almost all its real estate divided up according to caste system based zoning regulation, like this caste gets this village kind of stuff. Then if you're an outcast, you have a problem because you have nowhere to actually even stand, right? Or like which wells can you draw water from, that kind of thing. So uh, I, I think that there's something to that, a standard that becomes both consensus and adopted enough to be monopolistic and creates outsized costs, that's kind of universal. Um, mm. Are there outcasts in India? Yeah, I mean, there always have been. So uh, in the modern sort of uh, Indian state, they get special like affirmative action privileges and so forth. So there's like a whole scheme of like affirmative action for both the lower castes who are included within the caste system, as well as outcasts who are not included. So there are um, like called scheduled castes and tribes and there's like whole, you can get like uh, preferential uh, access to jobs and government services and stuff. It's not just like in the US, the affirmative action thing is like a bit of a shit show, but there's intent to right the historic uh, wrongs and so forth. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. oh yeah, speaking of um, that kind of thing, currencies, uh, Bitcoin, would you call it a universal currency? Yes. Uh, not yet, of course, but- in... No, I think it's universal. There's markets and people use it in almost every country in the world. Like even the outcast countries of Iran and North Korea have been working very hard to like build up their community. They, they, like, they own Bitcoin, people in those communities own Bitcoin. Okay, so would you say it's more universal than the US dollar? Mm, mm, see, this is hard because then I, I wanna know like in what arena are we talking? Um, yeah, because uh, there's the technical properties of being tradable or uh, like useful and hard to confiscate. And mm -hmm. if you actually were holding dollar assets in like the banking system of a country that's falling apart, the government might like just step in and like Argentina did this, right? I think um, 2015 or 16, they basically froze all dollar accounts and only allowed withdrawals and uh, pesos. So that kind of thing can happen with the dollar. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, that yeah. can happen in any banking system, right? Um, yeah. Some yeah. of my favorite history from, uh, what's the guy's name? There's like this kind of old in a journalist in like the 1800s wrote a pretty famous book called the something like the madness of crowds and hysteria. Oh yeah, yeah, that one. Um, yeah, yeah. I know the one you mean. And he's got one, I wanna say, it's not on Louisiana, maybe it's on like the Mississippi, France is like Mississippi. Um, yeah, the Mississippi company, the stock, uh, the John yeah. Lowe episode, John the Law Scottish gangster. Yeah. Thing. And there's like details in that story. It's just one quick chapter. Um, the first hundred pages of it. Oh, it's Charles Mackey's. Oh, um, Charles Mackey's, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The first hundred, so I actually, I got like a little thin book that was like just the first hundred pages. It covers like three different little vignettes basically. Um, so it's really quick to read, but um, anyways, the one about the Mississippi scandal or um, is really interesting in that the details they give about how the French state, the French state basically goes bankrupt. It's really interesting the details they give about how they attempt to claw back money. And it has a lot of like, you drop off all your gold coins and we give them all back to you. The same number of coins, each one's like half an ounce, like less. Or um, so you just like give haircuts or like they just started like confiscating all the gold and silver that anyone had anywhere. Yeah, so there's a lot of confiscation stuff. Anyways, I want to go back to this Bitcoin thing. Sorry, that was a tangent. I want to go back to this Bitcoin thing. The question you asked is if Bitcoin's universal and we kind of were comparing it more universal than US dollars, right? Um, so like, okay, maybe what would be like a, a good, um, like, okay, let's if you pick a random person in like Iran and I don't know, Nigeria, are they more likely to have in their possession Bitcoin or US dollars? That seems like a good, mm, is that a good test? I don't think it is because if you look at number of 
people who hold any Bitcoin at all, it's still like a hugely tiny fraction of, forget the dollar, like more people hold random regional currencies, like, you know, the rupee or the renminbi or the yen or anything. That wasn't the question. The question is it more widely universal than the US dollar, right? But then you have to ask in what sense widely, like if you have like one person from each country holding Bitcoin, in that sense, it's probably more universal than most currencies. But that seems like kind of um, shaky. But if, like, no, but if you were to randomly select like 20 people from each, like from like five different countries and then see if they own Bitcoin, USD, Bitcoin or USD and like ran a survey that way, that seems like a fairly like fair test of the actual penetration of it as a currency, right? That's kind of interesting. I think in general, both would fail that test. Like if you like, if you think about the US dollar, only about 3% of the world's population has uh, uh, ever traveled outside their home country. I think it's actually 1% and then 3% over lifetime or something like that, which means that most people don't ever leave like their 20% home. of Australians. So um, like apparently like really yeah. some countries are super skewed the other way then because Australia is holding up. Yeah, so there's the, um, small rich countries with a culture of lots of global travel. Then there's large, slightly less rich countries like the US where people are kind of like insular and don't like to travel. Then there's like... Uh, countries with a lot of migration in and out like in the Middle East and then there's com- countries that are just poor and only like the uh, middle class and above can travel like India or China. Yeah. Uh, so I think the test would work if you had a much larger sample. Like if you said something like sample a random 20% of the population, not 20 people, but 20%, then it might work. Yeah. Uh, but I think in general, we are actually talking about different standards of universality with Bitcoin and uh, uh dollar because a dollar is more tradable and usable in more contexts directly, but it's also fundamentally um, more like, you know, insecure and people can steal it. The government can take it away from you and stuff. Whereas Bitcoin, it's harder to transact. I mean, you need computer infrastructure to do it. I mean, I'm kind of thinking of like, if I have like just cash, it's kind of hard to find places that'll take cash these days, depending where on the United States you are. So I think it really depends but on... push what... come to shove, they will. I mean, if it, if there's like an apocalypse and the ATM machines are down and the credit card networks are down, people will take cash, like gold. When's the last time you ended up in a situation where your networks were down and you needed to buy things? It's not uh, network down stuff, but more like, you know, farmer's market where the person mm-hmm. simply doesn't accept credit cards or something like that. Yeah, but that's not what you were talking about. So you, you've never been in a situation where you had to have cash for an emergency because you needed it, right? Not in a long time. Yeah, it's been 15, 20 years, at least not in the US. When I've traveled abroad, many countries have a much stronger cash culture, even advanced ones. Like um, I think Switzerland, interestingly enough, has a highly suspicious culture where they kind of like are suspicious of the government, which Mm -hmm. is one reason crypto has found a foothold there. But they also have more cash transactions and people kind of like save cash and stuff. Well, and that's, I think that's a good point is that credit cards have become, so for Americans, our way of doing online transactions or like, it was based on the credit card proliferation that happened in the seventies here. So that become a, an easy way, like a pretty easy way to get access to um, digital transactions. Whereas credit cards have never, I don't think there's another country that I know of outside of America where credit cards are as widely distributed amongst the populace. And in Europe, they tend to be like way more debit card oriented yeah. is my understanding. So like actually like implementing payment solutions in other countries that don't have a strong culture of credit cards has been very difficult is my understanding. Huh, that's kind of interesting because I think now we're talking about universal currencies as they are associated with universal identities or universal identifiers. Like there's countries where that's actually one way cash is actually more like Bitcoin than it is like, so you should, when you think of dollar, you should actually think of like cash, anonymous paper cash as equivalent to a class of instruments that include like, you know, bit, Bitcoin and other sort of um, uh, identity less currencies, as well as things like bearer bonds or gold, where you can like hand it off and like identity doesn't necessarily travel with the transaction, right? Um in Bitcoin, you can still discover it, but like, for example, Zcash, there's like ways to anonymize and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, so gold actually would be more on the anonymous end. So universal identifiers is kind of interesting. So that's another list to, oh. our, add to our list of universal IDs. Universal right? things. 
global yeah. namespaces and in some global namespace, my identifier is unique. Hmm. No, okay. I'm, I'm gonna just table that. There's one other comment I wanted to make about the currency thing. Apparently 85% of central banks like across the world are currently considering implementing a digital currency. Yeah, but I think the way so they're thinking issuing, about it, yeah. Well, in, I was going to say, instead of issuing, like, so the, may, the big change there, and I think I'm reading a really great book right now that I was just tweeting about. Um, it's called The Money Problem. I think it's by Morgan Ricks. Um, have you read this? No. I'm oh, so about. good. It's one of the best books. Anyways, um, so the interesting thing is that he well, he's discussing how money works and really, I find, like, well, I don't know how accessible it is, but it's really good. Uh, he's discussing kind of how banking system works and how banks work. Um, anyways, you kind of can do like the, the stuff that, so what the government issues is like, um, is like currency, right? It's like money. Mm -hmm. it, like, the, the government is responsible for producing the paper product that is money. Um, and that's what they hand out and send out to people. And then you take that and you put that in the bank and the bank does some transmorphication and issues you a new token that's actually a deposit token and it represents deposits at that bank. And the reason that you can use those deposits with every other bank is that any bank in the system agrees that those bank tokens that they have, it's denominated in US dollars, but they're actually bank tokens that are represented by the deposit you've given them. Um, um, those are redeemable. So you can walk up to the thing and say, hey, bank, you've given me these bank credits for a deposit. Um, but I'd actually like to get the government money back. Anyways, um, the CBDC thing would actually replace this with a thing on a blockchain that you get instead. And then, um, anyways, it's just kind of different. Would that be uh, anonymous? Would it be like cash as in it can't be traced to who's holding it? I So that depends 100% on the implementation details, right? I would assume yeah. that it is not going to be, I would assume that it is going to be strongly tied to identity. Exactly. So that's my point. Like um, the distinction really is between whether or not it's tied to identity and uh, a currency is only useful for governments if it is in fact, at least in 90% of the cases tied to identity. Like they can allow or tolerate like a 10% margin of like um, anonymous transactions. But if it grows too much, that what you can think of as a gray or black economy, then governments are basically starting to get undermined, right? So they fear that. Yeah, no, and I think this is going to be, I mean, I think central bank currencies are going to be like kind of dystopian and that the level of control it gives someone else over your like cash deposits is going to be crazy. So in a way, what you could say is the, historically currencies have had both sort of faces. Like gold is a good example. Like gold with um, uh, that can be melted down into anything else is like truly completely fungible and anonymous. On the other hand, a piece of gold with a particular fixed percentage of like silver and an embossed, uh, you know, image of a king's face or something like that, that's fairly identifiable with a serial number. And then maybe you can even track it as in you paid somebody else with this coin with this serial number. Coins don't have serial numbers, but like banknotes do. Uh, uh, but, but that makes me think of like a couple of different attributes of uh, universality. Uh, one, this idea that in a country, everybody agrees that everybody will accept the central bank's backed currency. It reminds me of like um, the idea of a universal donor in blood types, right? So O group is a universal donor and uh, uh, what is it? I think AB is the universal acceptor or something like that. So there's like universality in that sense. And that, that got me thinking of, there's like symbolic and sort of, um, yeah, I guess, symbolic and representational aspects of universalism. And then there's like functional aspects. So it kind of doesn't matter what we decide as a universal currency, so long as we agree on the same thing. But on uh, other things, it actually does matter. Like, you know, it does matter what you and I uh, agree is a standard size box for container shipping, because once we decide that it's going to be uh, 20 foot is going to be the standard and multiples of 20 feet. Now like ships and warehouses and cranes and all sorts of things are going to start getting designed around a 20 foot equivalent container. So there's like there a universal standard starts to get into functional areas. And then you get into this interesting question of how good is it at that function? And then you come to this uh, classic engineering trade-off of like 
you've either got like one size fits all and it's not particularly good at anything uh like you know a microsoft um office suite with like a million products on it and all of them kind of do a decent job at the function but none of them is as good as best in class solutions so there's that trade off between kind of good enough at most things but not versus best in class like take usb right like i've heard people complaining a lot about like a uh, usb works fine for like you know uh disk transfer rates from like a usb stick or like simple things like charging your phone but you try to do something more complex you'll run into all sorts of problems like the voltage drop will be too much um weird shit will happen so it's universal only in sort of the symbolic sense and if you actually try to push the functional limits of universalism it starts to crumble yeah you get to the edges you know it's interesting so i worked at walmart when i was in college i did an internship at their it department at their headquarters um and one point i sat down and talked to someone so the i was on the product group that was responsible for the um the digital systems that maintain like the um uh what do they call it i'm forgetting the word but it's basically like the entire like price list and every single like item that walmart mm-hmm. sells anywhere um at one point i was talking to some guy who was like a product manager or something on it somewhere in the organization around this stuff about um kind of the holy grail for walmart is the universal item that you can sell in every store around the world um because that means that you can just ship it anywhere you like produce them you send it anywhere you don't have to like figure out where to send it where not to send it and, like where it's like viable or whatever you just like produce this one thing you send it everywhere um somehow this tied into what you're talking about earlier i don't remember now yeah that that's kind of interesting uh, there's universal standards as a way to make things uh, uh have economies of scale. scale right like uh, mcdonald's yeah. would prefer to have the consistently standard way of producing a burger around the world but there's like two sources of like uh, how that gets screwed up like for example they use idaho potatoes for their fries but if you make them in the us it's cheap because the supply chain is short but now if you're making like you know, idaho potato fries in like japan you kind of have to ship those potatoes around the world and it might be better to use local potatoes right and on the other hand you also have to customize for taste uh, like uh, when mcdonald's entered india there was the beef taboo to deal with so the beef burger which is the central item in the mcdonald's menu kind of became impossible so in india a chicken burger is kind of the feature like meat item and there's a bunch of like custom things so that that actually fits into the theme of one size fits all is kind of like not particularly good for any of the things it fits and sometimes customization gets you a lot of um, benefits yeah well yeah ah uh, so uh, in general do you think you're kind of like a universalist or kind of like a customized <coughs> plus you so uh, are you a universalist as in you'll buy a platform or that'll have like a mediocre version of everything or are you more likely to like eclectically select like the best in class of everything and like stock your house or whatever with the best of each you're talking about interoperability right not Just necessarily that. interoperability like uh, interoperable interoperability is a nice thing to have like if you sign up with microsoft you get like everything that talks to each other i'm thinking even in uh, terms of like um, uh, putting items in your kitchen like do you buy sets of pans or everything from surla tab or something or do you mix and match a lot i'm a mix and matcher okay i'm a mix and matcher too uh and i think there's i think that speaks to like both uh, interoperability as a functional thing and uh, aesthetics like some people have mix and match aesthetics and some people have like universal harmony kind of aesthetics yeah I think that's true. Yeah. I mean like I'm thinking specifically of my like pans that I have in my kitchen right now and they're all over the place. Um I kind of wish that I basically use exclusively cast iron and carbon steel pans. Um it's kind of a, they're beast. Um but uh what was I going to say? Oh, I have one that's not like the I have three cast iron pans and one is not like the others and it does bother me only cuz it's heavier. So you do have a standard it, it may not be like a universal standard in the sense of everything bought from like Sur la Table or something mm-hmm. but it's universal in the sense of like you have a certain aesthetic and all your stuff is cast iron or um, carbon steel right you don't have Teflon coated things or something so there's like standards you impose no. mm-hmm. I don't have yeah 
no, there's no Teflon coated stuff. And if you don't have Teflon coating, like, what are you doing? You know, like, okay, so, kind of stick, so. Yeah, we have, I think, an incoherent mix of like some standards versus not. Some things are match sets, like our plates are a match set, but our mugs are not. And then we have both like cast iron and like coated nonstick things. So it's it's all over the place. But yeah, yeah I tend to be bad for you, Venkat. You got to throw it out. What? Nonstick's bad for you. You got to throw yeah. it out. We're all going to die anyway. I've had a good run. Carbon steel, man. Yeah, but they, at this point, you're just negotiating which way you get leave, right? Like how you get out. I tend not to be the whole body is a temple purist kind of thing. So I'm like, all right, I already treat it like a garbage can and there's enough contaminants of all sorts going in. So screw that. Carbon yeah. steel, man, is all I'm saying. Carbon steel is great. It's nonstick. It's easy to clean. Most of the time. I prefer nonstick. Cleanup is easier. Cooking is easier. You don't have to worry about seasoning and other shit. Yeah, but I, I do use um, cast iron and carbon steel for some things. All right. Huh. So we are, we're drifting a little bit from universalism as a team. Uh, but yeah, all right. We have, a, I guess, we have a couple of minutes left. Any other universal things that sort of pop for you while we were speaking? I think, I think I hit all of the stuff I thought of. There was something I felt like you started down a while ago. I'm not going to remember what it was. That was interesting. The I, I think there's more to be said about universal donor, universal acceptor kind of thing. Like uh, there's something there. Like, uh, uh, but I, I can't quite put my finger on it. But there's something there. Hmm. Anyway, so that's our universal episode. Yeah, hopefully it'll be universally adored and loved as a, <laughs> um, a piece of content to consume. Um, In its tiny market, it'll be a universal monopoly. And there will be a high cost to ignoring this episode. Mm, I see. Yeah. yeah. Outsized cost of not getting on board the Scorpio season train. Cool. All yes. right. Well, it's always a pleasure, Venkat. Oh, always oh, a pleasure. Next is T? No. No, we are at the U is universal, so V. Next is a V. All right. I can talk about myself. Venkat? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about Venkat next yeah. week. Like we fun. need to think up a better V topic. Victory. Victory. Um, All right. Victory. Let's do victory. All right. Victory. Sounds like All right. Victory. See you next time. All right. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.